This is the world of Pokemon, where I can truly feel like I'm free and have a fancy haircut. Does that even look like me? Pokemon to me is extremely nostalgic, and I buy these games every single year in hopes to relive my childhood. Now, there have been sightings of Titan Pokemon causing destruction throughout the Paladia region. So, it is my mission to become a Pokemon champion, just like my boy Ash, who finally did it after 25 years. Sort of. First, I have to defeat all eight gym leaders, stop the menacing Team Star, and yo, what the? And uncover the secrets within the great crater of Paldia, also known as Area Zero. Now, one day in Pokemon is 30 minutes in real life, so I'm going to be surviving for the next 100 days. And make sure you subscribe, and so my journey begins. So, day one began inside of my mom's house, completely dripping with a new outfit. I mean, look at me. I'm destined to be a Pokemon trainer. I went downstairs and spoke to my mom. And the first thing she said was this. The school contacted me and said that you're supposed to wait here a little while longer. And the first thing I heard was the door knocking. And a random dude showed up. He just walked in here. I am the director of UVA Academy. You may call me Mr. Clavel. Now, I don't know what he was doing here or why he was seeing my mom. But it was kind of weird. But it is what it is. So I walked outside and I was introduced to the three starter Pokemon. First was Sprigatito, the grass cat Pokemon. Then Fuecoco, the fire croc Pokemon. And Quaxly, the duckling Pokemon. Now, this was a very hard choice. And this wouldn't be a Pokemon journey without my mom hooking me up with some kind of a futuristic iPhone Pokedex hybrid. It's called the Rotom Phone. It's like a Pokedex and an iPhone combined. Just take a look at me, walking with all three star Pokemon. So I made my way towards the mansion. I don't know Director Clavel was like the next Elon Musk. I mean, where did he even get the money to buy a mansion? As soon as I got there, my starter Pokemon disappeared. Quaxley was playing in the pond. Spigotito was sniffing flowers and Fuecoco was burning peaches. Then I met my next door neighbor named Nimona, potentially my rival or future girlfriend. You get the point. And I chose Fuecoco as my starter Pokemon just because fire types are far superior. And I called him Breakfast. On day two, I went down to the beach and had my first fight against Nimona. I absolutely wiped out her Pokemon team with my fire type. Look at you, winning your first battle ever. You've got even more potential than I thought. I'll show you the ropes before I take you to the academy. And then she said to follow her because she had a surprise for me. I followed Nimona and she gave me a Pokeball to catch my first Pokemon, which was the Lechonk. I caught Spider-Man on a tree. What does that even say? Tarantula? Oh, uh, oh, that makes sense. <laughs> caught a bird named Fletchling. And a Hoppip. Then walked around the area and found a bunch of Pokeloo, including a rare candy and random items. On day three, heard a roar coming from the beach. Well, who is that? It was a washed up purple dinosaur just chilling there. So I whipped out my trusty foot long sandwich and fed him. I've never seen a Pokemon eat a sandwich, but it makes sense. Oh, and then it transformed into this battle form. Yo, Goku, chill! Like, how is that even possible? We walked inside of this mossy cave, and it was surrounded with a bunch of hound doors led by a gigantic houndoom. I was trapped, and I was probably gonna die, but just in the nick of time, Mariden rescued me, and Hulk jumped his way out of here. And then I met a trainer named Arvin, which was the original Pokeball holder for Mariden. Now you're the son of that Pokemon researcher, Professor Turo? Doesn't matter who my dad is. I battled Arvin and completely wiped out his team with just breakfast. I mean, look at him. He was using a chipmunk to fight a crocodile. Somebody tells me he was extremely upset. Anyways, as a reward, I received Mariden's Pokeball and he was officially mine. On day four, I traveled to the South Providence and arrived at Mesagoza City. As I walked upstairs, I saw a person with an Eevee backpack getting bullied. And then out of nowhere, this person pulled out a TikTok dance that looked like a star. That right there is Team Star, the most menacing Pokemon team out there in the world. You thought Team Rocket was bad? No, you don't know what you're talking about. Anyways, as a reward for defeating Team Star, Nimona gave me a Terra Orb, which allows you to terrestrialize your Pokemon and change their typing. I headed to the UVA Academy for my first day of school. Now, I'm a student, so I gotta go to school and get educated, right? Uh, this is gonna be great. Arvin instantly wanted to become friends, and he was asking me for a favor to find him special herbs. I don't know what this guy's talking about, but it was called Herba Mystica. There are five different types, and each of them belong to the Titans, which are currently causing havoc on Paldea region. That means we gotta stop them and save the world. I was sent to the director's office where I met Professor Turo talking about Mariden. 
its Pokemon was also originally mine. I assume you received it from a young man called Arvin. I got his contact information and I left. And then Nimona walked me to my school dorm, which is where I'm going to be living. <laughs> what did she just say? The next day, I woke up and we all met up at the schoolyard. Director Clavel had a few things to say to us. As usual, the theme will be treasure hunt. Explore Paladia's abundant nature, soak in the rich areas, discover the Pokemon that live here, and get to know people too. Where will you travel, who will you meet, and what will you achieve? Let the treasure hunt begin! Onward! My first objective was to take on a gym. So, I traveled to the West Gate and started my journey. Throughout the place, I caught a various amount of Pokemon, I battled some trainers just for fun, and I found a bunch of Pokeloo. Slowly, I was filling out my Pokédex and getting closer and closer to completing it, which was not going to be an easy task, honestly. But yeah, I caught a lot of Pokémon, and during this process, my Pokémon team leveled up. I managed to get Beckfist to level 15, while Leafy, my Sprigatito that I transferred over from Pokémon Scarlet, I got him up to level 12. I have another Nintendo Switch with the Pokemon Scarlet copy. So yeah, I, I played that and I transferred it over. So slowly but surely, I was building the most menacing Pokemon team out there that can wipe out anything in my way, including the Pokemon gyms. Did I mention that I didn't stop trading? No, I, I kept going. I played this game nonstop. I forgot what food was. I forgot even sleep existed. But finally, it was worth it. My breakfast evolved into a Crocolore. And then I came across a Terrestrialized Scyther, which was extremely high level and was going to be my ticket to boosting through everything. Now, catching a Terrestrialized Pokemon wasn't that much of a challenge. You had to use all your powerful attacks, get its health down, and once the Terrestrialized form breaks, you can throw a Pokeball and catch it. And to my surprise, right afterwards, Leafy managed to evolve into a Florigato. Florigato? Florigato? What? So I got completely sidetracked and continued exploring. I came across the South Providence area too, and that's where I found my first crystal. This means my first terror raid battle! Yes! I've never done one of these, but this was a lot of fun. You have a timer to defeat this strong Pokemon with a team. And once you defeat it, you're able to catch it right afterwards, and it has a special terror type. On day seven, I went cliff diving. Okay, it's not really a cliff, but I climbed the wash tower, and at the top was a new Pokemon called Gimme Ghoul. And if you collect 999 Gimme Ghoul coins, you receive a special Pokemon. On days 8 through 10, I continued battling the nearby Pokemon and slowly training them up, so this way I wouldn't be underleveled for any gym battles. And I gotta say, these Terra Pokemon had some really wacky looking hats. Like, what is that? This Diglett has an entire Colosseum on top of his head. Makes sense. On days 11 to 13, I arrived at Cortando. And there, I met up with a businessman that taught me how to craft TMs. Afterwards, I visited the local restaurants, got me some breakfast and ice cream. Okay, this is like really bugging me. I don't understand why they have a teriyaki ice cream flavor. But what, what? Okay, anyways, I arrived at the bug gym. And for my gym test, I had to take on the most intense gym challenge of all time. Something that not even Ash Ketchum could complete. This is the olive roll. It was probably the easiest thing I've ever done in a Pokemon game. I would have honestly preferred to battle gym trainers, but no. I had to roll an olive into a goal. Anyways, I passed my gym test, and Katie waited for me for her battle. I met with Katie, the owner of the bug gym. Now, her specialty was making cakes. My name is Katie, and I am the gym leader here in Cortano. So, the battle began, and Katie was in for a treat. G -g get it? <laughs> oh, man. With my fire-type Pokemon... I was able to completely destroy Katie's team. All she was using was Bug-type Pokemon, and that was not going to be enough to stop me. So, by using Incinerate, I wiped out Katie's entire Pokemon team. Every single Bug-type Pokemon was burnt to crisp. Even that Teddy Ursa that terrestrialized into a Bug-type, that was probably the worst thing it could have done. After the battle, we took a photo together, and she hooked me up with some cupcakes. So with the first gym badge, any Pokemon level 25 would now obey my commands. For my next adventure, I made a very ambitious goal. I was going to take on the Alphernada Gym, also known as the Psychic Gym. Now, that wasn't going to be so easy, because getting there is going to be very difficult with the current situation that I'm in. And what I meant by that is Maridan is not strong enough to jump, fly, or do anything crazy yet. Also, Pokemon there are like level 55, but we're just going to attempt it anyways. So, I continued doing what I was best at. Catching a lot of Pokemon. And along the way, I came across a rare Pokemon known as Charcadet. So, you guessed it. I caught him and continued catching some more Pokemon. I found some bug types, water types, even some more terrestrialized Pokemon. And then I came across another Terror Raid battle. This one had a Jigglypuff. 
and it was a little bit more of a challenge than I expected. But there was nothing that Beckfist couldn't handle. So I mud slapped that Jigglypuff in the face and completely blinded him. That was a little bit messed up. In the distance, I spotted a storm on top of a mountain, and that obviously looked like something special. So I went up there, I battled some trainers along the way, and next thing you know, there was a Titan. Yes, that's right. Arvin called me up, and he was telling me that the open sky Titan lives there. And he happens to be dropping boulders at his enemies. So what did I do? You guessed it. I hopped on Moraiden, we went up the mountain, and we dodged these giant boulders. And in no time, the Titan flew down from the sky, and what do you know? It was a gigantic bird! And this thing looked exactly like a stork. I'm talking about the ones that can deliver babies. Or is that only in the movies? So Beckfist and I battled the Bombardier, the open sky Titan, and with just one attack, we destroyed this bird. Afterwards, it lunged its face towards a mountain, broke it, and ate some kind of weird herbs inside. I think that's the Herba Mystica that uh, Arvin was talking about. And what do you know? Look, Arvin showed up. And those herbs were no joke. The Bombardier powered up into its final form. Trying to drop rocks on folks is dangerous. Let's give this thing a good taste of its own medicine. Now, I really wanted a challenge. So, I retrieved Beckfist and sent out Leafy to wrestleize him. Then used a few attacks, hit him with a U-turn, and disappeared out of the battle. And for my final Pokemon, I sent in Scyther to finish the job. Hey, Bombardier! How do you like these rocks? Yeah, not so nice, huh? Looks like we don't have to worry about any more boulders falling on us now. So I followed Arvin inside of the cave, and that's where we found a Herba Mystica. Yes, we actually found one. And it's all thanks to you, Moose. Thanks, buddy. I appreciate it. So we took this beautiful photo to remember the memory. Now that we had defeated one Titan, we had four more to go. On days 19 to 22, I traveled back to the Messer Goza city. I went through the East Gate and went searching for the next Titan Pokemon, including the next gym leader. Along the way, I battled a few Pokemon, such as this thing right here. I kept on catching as many Pokemon I can get my hands on, and I found a bunch of Pokeloot in this area. Afterwards, I came across a terrestrialized Jigglypuff, which was a very easy battle for me. There is nothing that Beckfist could not handle. I'm telling you, fire types are overpowered. Especially a crocodile. That is a fire type. I mean, have you ever seen a crocodile on fire before? Nah, I don't think so. As I kept on exploring, I found a bunch of Pokeloot, including XP candies, TMs, and other things. Afterwards, I found a raid, and I decided to take it on. And it was a dragon-type Rolt. I have never seen that before, so I decided to battle it. And in a matter of seconds, we completely took this thing out. So I threw the Pokeball and captured the Rolt. As I explored the next location, I found a Spork. It's like a jumping pig on a spring. So I caught it. I kept on exploring the area. I came across a bunch of different trainers, like Backpacker Samuel. And he had a Starly that I cooked up with breakfast. I also found a Stantler. Now, this thing just reminds me of a moose, so I gotta get this guy on my team. Now, there is a legendary moose inside of this Pokemon game, so make sure you watch till the end to see me capture one. Trust me, moose army, you do not want to miss this. It's our moment to shine as mooses. Surprisingly, Beckfist had some trouble fighting a Hariyama, so I had to show him how it's done by using Leafy. And when that didn't work, I sent him the Toxtricity and wiped this dude out, catching him on my Pokemon team. On days 23 to 25, I came across this ominous black stake. So I pulled it out of the floor, and the next thing you know, it just crumbled. But later in the video, I found out that it belongs to legendary ruined Pokemon. So anyways, I got a bunch of Pokeballs, and then when I was near this location, Arvin called me up. Apparently, there was a Stony Cliff Titan lurking nearby, so that was my responsibility to stop him. So this meant war. Now, I was really overthinking it. I kept on fighting more trainers, trying to get some levels just for the heck of it. I kind of felt like I was under level for the Titan, but uh, to my mistake, uh, I was very wrong. And guess what? I found a crab named Cloth. And nearby, I found ruins, which had a Tinka Tank and a bunch of Gimme Ghoul coins. So I caught the nearby Pokemon, including the Drowsy, found a Bronzor, and then I battled this Graffiti Lady Trainer, which sent out a Fido. This is the only game that I know that has Pokemon that are made of dough. I'm pretty sure that dog is made of bread. I'm just saying. And I caught one of my favorite Pokemon, a Growlithe. The next thing I tried out was the outside battling. So I sent out Beckfist and he battled the nearby goat Pokemon, which was also a really great way to get some levels. Now, I ran into one gigantic problem. So my Pokemon badge only allowed level 25 Pokemon to obey my commands. And as Beckfist was getting into a higher level and my Pokemon team being over level 40, this was a big issue. So now I had to get some more gym badges. 
while defeating titans and stuff. The next few days, I spent my time climbing ladders in this gigantic mountain system. I'm not really sure why they were here, but I just kept on climbing. But then, I found a back entrance to the Titan. It was a gigantic crab stuck on a wall. That's right. This, this is Cloth. This stony cliff Titan. He jumped down and ambushed me. And I one-shot him with Leafy. It was so easy. And the funny thing is, he ran away. But that was not going to stop me. Uh-oh, that's not good. Cloth smashed his hand through the wall, causing a crater, and picked out the Herba Mystica. As soon as he ate it, he just powered up like a Super Saiyan. So I used my favorite attack called Seed Bomb and absolutely one-shot Cloth. I'm telling you, Leafy possibly has a chance to become better than Beckfist. I'm just saying. We walked inside of the cave and found a Herba Mystica, which was the source of power for the Titan. Then Arvin made a special sandwich, and that's when Mariadon showed up. Clearly, Mariadon loves footlong sandwiches. I don't know what his obsession is, but as soon as it ate one, it powered up. Arvin was also very, very mad that he was trying to eat my sandwich. Well, that did not stop Arvin from revealing his top secret thing. It was Mabostiff. Apparently, Arvin has a dog that was injured in Area Zero, and since then, he's been taken care of by feeding it Herba Mystica, which is probably the reason why Arvin has been defeating Titan Pokemon and finding random herbs. Day 30, I came across a Terrestrialized Dunsparce. I love this Pokemon. It just gives me memories to the Pokemon Emerald game. I finished up exploring the area. I found some TMs, and for some reason, I thought these glowing Pokemon were shinies, but that wasn't the case. I found a Magikarp, a Surviper, a Barboach, Oinkalone, and Gumshoes. Then I opened up my trusty bag, whipped out the XP candies, and I leveled up Beckfist. And so, I battled the trainer, and after defeating it, my Crocolore started evolving into Skelly Dirge. Look at him! It looks amazing! My favorite part is this flame bird on top of his head, which turns into a fire microphone when using attacks. Anyways, I climbed the nearby watchtower, and I got Drain Punch, and I found me a Gimme Ghoul. On days 31 and 32, I explored the East Province area. Here by this location, I found a Squawkabilly, an Oricorio, a Murkrow, a Shuppet, and my Glimmet started evolving into a Glamrock. Now, I had a problem. I couldn't use Glamrock in a battle because it was such a higher level. Though so the only thing I could do was get the next gym badge. Now, this is not going to be so easy for me. I kept getting distracted by catching more Pokemon. It's like the inner trainer inside of me. I just can't resist. The next day, I tried the brand new picnic system, which allows you to throw your Pokemon, play with them with a ball, pet them, wash them, and do whatever you want. So my first contestant was Beckfist. I gave him a nice bath, which... Doesn't make much sense because it's a fire type, but I think he enjoyed it. Next up was Leafy, which is also having a pretty good time. Just gotta watch out for those claws, though. Then it was time for Mariah, probably the cutest one of them all. Shellgun also enjoyed the bath as well. And finally, it was time for me to create a sandwich. That's right, I'm a professional chef. You don't believe me? Well, guess what? My Pokemon absolutely loved it. So, I present to you a three-star sandwich, which gives you a random boost for encountering Pokemon. After all this traveling, I finally arrived at the Artisan City. So I drove right over to the gym, and I made my way inside. And to my surprise, Nimona was inside waiting for me. So wild that we ended up randomly visiting the same gym at the same time again. What a weird coincidence. Well, here we were with the next gym test. This time, I had to seek out the sun floors inside of the city, which was clearly the most difficult thing ever. That was me being sarcastic. I had to find 15 some floors, and, uh, well, as you can see, it was kind of easy to spot them. But in no time, I found them, and I was finally ready to battle the gym leader. And what do you know? He jumped out of a windmill. Can you believe this guy? This is the gym leader, Bracius, also known as the grass gym leader. And Beckfist was completely obliterating them with his fire attacks. This was probably the easiest gym battle ever. It lasted for, like, 30 seconds. So, I defeated the terrestrialized Sudowudo, took a picture with him, and received the Trailblaze TM. You smell that? That's the salt coming off of Bracius. He was clearly upset. Once the battle was over, I was greeted by a random stranger. And turns out, that right there was my language class teacher. That's right. That's my actual teacher from school. But I still had some unfinished business. I got just enough levels for Leafy to evolve into a Meowskarada. Just look at him. He looks exactly like a magician. The next few days, I continued my adventures. I started off my day by battling some raid Pokemon. I also found a Floetta, which I defeated, and then captured it with a Pokeball. Then, I came across a Spidops, which was a new Pokemon that I hadn't caught before. 
Holy mooses. When I saw this Pikachu, I freaked out. If you know me, I love Pikachu. So I right away caught him, and then I finally arrived at the next Pokemon Center. This was the city of Lavencia. I made my way to the gym, and I walked inside. That's when Nemo gave me a phone call, and she just showed up out of nowhere and decided to battle me. This is the moment we were both waiting for, but Nemo's Pokemon were very underleveled, and by using my Torch Song attack, it increased my special attack by each stage. So I wiped out her Florigato with no problem. It was honestly very embarrassing, I'm just saying. But at this moment, I realized that I was extremely overpowered. Trust me, you're gonna find out very soon. Now, before I could take on the gym test, I all know Yona, whatever you wanna call her, she made me challenge her gym trainer fans. That, that's right, I was battling her fans and defeating them like it wasn't an issue. I mean, come on, you already know by now that Beckfist can handle anything. Challenge was simple. I had to find Director Clavel in a bunch of photos, and when I did that, I would have to battle the next trainer. So after finding him three times in the photos and then battling three different gym trainers, I was ready for my final challenge. And by that, I meant hearing Iona talk. Give me a battle that electrifies all my viewers, pals. Now, she's a streamer, so that means that every time she does something, she's on a live stream, which is, I guess, a pretty cool gym leader. Oh, I sent out my Skelly Dirge, used my Torch Song, stacked up the attack, and wiped out the entire team. But she did have a trick up her sleeve. Since she was an electric gym leader, she sent out a Miss Magius that was terrestrialized into an electric type. So, I finished the battle with my final attack. Our challenger came out victorious. Well done, Moose! We took a funny photo together, and I received Volt Switch. After the battle, I was greeted by Gita. She's the chairwoman of the Pokemon League and runs all the gyms. And most likely, we're gonna have to battle her. Days 39 to 41. With three gym badges under my belt, I continued my adventures. I caught a Chansey and a few new Pokemon in the area. Then I found this Pokemon called Varum, which looked like a giant engine. Or should I say, Vroom Vroom, get it? Okay, so I killed this thing like three to four times, and finally, with the help of Leafy, I got it. That's right, I had a pretty close call, but I finally captured it. Now I spotted a weird thing sticking out of the floor, and it turned out to be a Titan Pokemon. The name was Earthworm, the lurking steel Titan. And with one fire attack, Beckfist obliterated its health. It ran away inside of this hole that it created, and I kept chasing it with Maraidon. But in no time, I caught up to him, and then it broke through another cave where it ate a Herba Mystica. And with a perfect timing, Arvin showed up. But the Titan Earthworm used its Super Saiyan mode. And out of all the Pokemon, Arvin brought a Tentacool that walks on two legs. That's not gonna do nothing. So I had Beckfist finish the job. In a matter of seconds, the Earthworm shrank and disappeared. Well, finally, we walked inside of the cave, and there it was, the Salty Herba Mystica. So, we took a salty photo together, and of course, Maraidon showed up for his sandwich. So, we fed them both. And let me tell you, they were extremely happy, and both of them powered up. Afterwards, Professor Turo gave me a phone call, and he told me that Maraidon had learned a new ability. If I jump up in the sky, I can hold B, and now I can jump even further. So, Maraidon and I Hulk jumped our way out of here. This made traveling extremely easy. Days 42 to 44, we traveled through the Dali Zava Passage. And along the way, I found so many new Pokemon. I mean, there was tons and tons of new Pokemon. So I got extremely sidetracked, but I caught them all. And the Glaciata Mountains was completely unforgiving with its weather. I'm honestly just glad that the Pokemon that I was battling was finally my level. Oh, I also found a dog that was called Houndstone. It was completely made of bones. And then I came across a terrestrialized Espathra, which is like an ostrich with uh, magnificent hair. Finally, I took on a raid battle that was somewhat difficult. It was against a Didini, I think that's what it's called. Well, by stacking on my torch song, I wiped it out and then I caught it. Now, I went to the Delhi Zappa Passage and inside there, I found a knackle stack. I also came across a Sawsbuck, which was in its current winter form or something like that. So I hopped in Maraidon and we made our way up to the Glaciata City. We went inside of the gym and Hussell introduced me to Rika, an Elite Four member. All right, no more chit chat. It was time for the Glaciata Gym Snow and Slope Run. Now this test was super simple. All I had to do was get on Maraidon's back, slide down the mountain, drift into the actual flags and hit the finish line without a problem. And once they made it to the end, I passed my test. It was finally time for the real deal. The ice gym leader known as Grusha. 
For some reason, Grusha was not happy to see me, and apparently, he was a professional snowboarder in his past. So, to start off the battle, he sent out Frost Mob. And, by using my Fire Type Backfist, I wiped out the team without an issue. I told you, Fire Types are overpowered. You can literally take out every single gym leader with just a Fire Type. Grusha did not stand a chance against me. He sent out his terrestrialized Ice Altaria, and this thing was surprisingly a challenge. It used Hurricane on me and it actually managed to do some damage. But Beckfist finished the job with Torch Song and that was it for the Altaria. Now Grusha seemed a little bit upset. But anyways, we took a photo together and I received the fourth gym badge, allowing level 40 Pokemon to finally listen to me. And as a reward, I received the Ice Spinner TM. So for the next few days, I made a plan to go to Montenavera City. I accidentally killed a Gabite, and I came across a terrestrialized Lucario. Now, this was no ordinary Lucario. This was a level 75 Ice Lucario. I could not believe that I found this Pokemon, and it was very challenging to actually catch. The Meteor Mash barely killed Beckfist, but he wiped out most of my Pokemon team. After I broke his terrestrialized form, I threw an Ultra Ball, it didn't work, and then I threw like 40 more Pokeballs, and it also didn't work. But eventually, I caught him with the mighty Great Ball, closing the deal on a level 75 Lucario. Even though he has really good stats, unfortunately, I can't use the Lucario until I get every single gym badge. So, I left the cave and I caught a Frigibax right outside, which was a new Dragon-type Pokemon in Generation 8. With my new motivation to get every single gym badge, I came across a Mabostiv, which turned into a Zoru. So, I caught him with a Pokeball. Then I found a Dash Bun, it's like a baked dog Pokemon, and it transformed into a Ditto. I could not believe it. I was so happy to find a Ditto, because that means now I can actually breed Pokemon. Then I found a Terrestrialized Breloom, which had a pretty cool looking Coral Seam on its head. So I caught that as well. And then I found a Mabostiff, but this time it was a real deal. No, it wasn't a Zoru, it was an actual Mabostiff. Anyways, I healed my Pokemon, and Cassiopeia gave me a phone call. And then I met this guy. The name is Clive. We're talking about going up against Team Star here. It's not something that you can join in for fun. I'm well aware. I just need to sort out some unsettled business with Team Star. That's all. It turns out I was outside of Team Star's base. And Clive, or Director Clavel, or whatever you want to call him, he showed up here to help me out. I walked up to the fun gate where I battled a Pokemon trainer named Harrington. He sent out a level 48 Morgrem. That was probably the highest level Pokemon that I battled with a trainer. So whatever area that I was in was clearly a very high level. So I defeated him and then I talked to the Team Grunt member. Cassiopeia gave me a phone call warning me about the Team Star's Fairy Crew, also known as the Rushba Squad. Now this is where things get a little bit confusing. Instead of battling the Rushba Squad, I went to another Team Star headquarters. This was the first Team Star headquarter known as the Fire Base. And every grunt that I faced in this actual location was extremely underleveled, so this is the correct order that you're supposed to actually battle in. But I just happened to go to the toughest Team Star base by accident. Right after the battle, my Friggybax started evolving, and it transformed into an Arctabax. I was so happy to get my Dragon-type evolved. When I least expected it, Cassiopeia called up Clive, and he showed up to help me out. Then we came across Charlos the Sharkadet, which was, I'm not sure why he was here, but I think he was looking for his trainer. So Cassiopeia gave me another phone call and told me that the boss named Mela was inside of this location. And it was my objective to go inside there and defeat the Sheeter Squad. To our unwanted guests, if you can defeat 30 of our Pokemon in the next 10 minutes, our boss might just honor you with an appearance. So that means I have 10 minutes to defeat 30 Pokemon by using my three Pokemon in my actual team. I know it sounds a little bit confusing, but it's super simple. All you gotta do is just run around, auto battle each Pokemon, and then once you complete 30, you're done. So, with the help of Leafy, Beckfist, and Glamora, these Pokemon did not stand a chance against me. In just under two minutes, I defeated every single Pokemon here without an issue. That's what I call a champion team. The curtains opened up, and a gigantic Starmobile showed up. Mela, the leader of the fire crew, was the one controlling the entire machine. And this vehicle was apparently a Pokemon, so she was battling me with her Pokemon on top of another Pokemon car thing, whatever it was, which was powered up by Varooms and Rev of Rooms. Yeah, it's a, it's a very weird Pokemon thing. 
Anyways, after I took out our team, I battled the Sheeter Starmobile, which was level 26. Now, of course, I could not go easy. So, I too rest the lies backfist and then used a couple of attacks to wipe out the Starmobile. My Shadow Ball did a ton of damage, my Hyper Voice was also very powerful, and in just under three attacks, the entire Team Star Firebase was completely gone, and Mela was defeated. Oh, hold on a second. My phone's ringing. Moose, it's me. It seems Mela no longer carries her star badge, the symbol of her status as a boss. Cassiopeia hooked me up with some young moolah cash money, and then another person showed up. This person was called Penny. It's the same person that I actually saved in the beginning of the video. She was the original person getting bullied by Team Star. On days 52 to 54, I was on a mission to defeat every single Team Star. So, I traveled to the next one, where I battled Yusuf. He had a Gulpin and a Shrudel, so defeating him was extremely easy. Afterwards, Clive showed up to help me out. So, I rang the Team Star door, and next thing you know, I walked inside. Now, once again, same exact challenge. I had to defeat 30 Pokemon in under 10 minutes. So, I sent out my three Pokemon, Beckfist, Leafy, and Glamora. All I was fighting was a bunch of bug Pokemon, and after a minute and 40 seconds, I defeated all 30. That was a record breaker for me. So, the Starmobile showed up, and it was controlled by Atticus, the boss of Team Star's Poison Krill. So, Atticus sent out a skunk, thinking that could defeat me, but clearly that was not going to work. There was no type of poison gas that could possibly obliterate Skelly Dirge or Beckfish. You get the point. Not even a muck could stand a chance. All I had to do was use one attack, and my special attack was so high up due to the stage increase that wiping out the Starmobile was super easy. It took me two hits. I think the most difficult part was when I got poisoned. But the level 32 Starmobile completely exploded, and that was the end of Atticus. Hey, on the right side, we took a phone together. There we go. And Atticus was super cool and kind enough to give me a new attack called Gunk Shot. It seems we're one step closer to the truth behind Team Star's truancy and the bullying at the academy. But more importantly, after this battle, I had some hopes for Team Star. I'm just gonna say that I don't think any of the Team Star members were actually bad at all. So Cassiopeia called me up, gave me some young mullet cash money, and then Penny showed up once again. At this time, Ryden came out of his Pokeball to say hi to Penny. Recruited them to the team in the first place. Hmm, I don't normally talk this much. Now my throat kind of hurts. So, um... Good luck with taking down the other bases and stuff. Okay, I, I, I gotta go. All right, days 55 to 56, I traveled to the North Province, which probably had the highest level Pokemon that I'd ever seen before. So first, I caught a Flareon. I traveled to the area, and I came across a waterfall, which had a bunch of Dratinis. And the Dratini line is actually my favorite Dragon-type Pokemon, especially Dragonite, so I was really happy to catch one. Right afterwards, I found a gigantic slacking, which was terrestrialized, and it was level 55. Luckily, with the help of Beckfist, I trained on my Pokemon team, and then I found a Vaporeon during a rainstorm. So, of course, I caught it with a nest ball. I couldn't believe my eyes, but I found a Drake Loke. This area that I was in was absolutely insane. Honestly, probably the best location to auto battle and level your team up. After about a few days, I was trained up and ready to take on the fighting team star. Her name is Eri. Eri, Riri, I don't know. She has a lot of different nicknames. So I battled the team grunt member. And then it got me thinking. I really missed the complexity of the old Pokemon games. We had to find a bunch of trainers. But at the same time, it's nice to see how much Pokemon has evolved with its graphics, riding, surfing, flying, and all that kind of stuff. So the alarms went off. And guess what? It was the same exact challenge. At this point, you already know what's going on here. I got 10 minutes to defeat 30 Pokemon, except these Pokemon are a little bit higher level. So yeah, it, it did take me some time, but I managed to complete the challenge in just under three minutes. As the Team Star grunts cried out for mercy, Eri, the boss of the Team Star fighting crew, showed up. She was driving a pretty crazy looking Starmobile. This one was an orange color and had disco balls. She sent out a level 55 Toxicroak, and the Pokemon she was using were actually pretty powerful. So, I terrestrialized Beckfist. But by stacking up my attacks, I managed to wipe out her team. And after using Torch Song like five times, at this point, it was already going to be over. No matter what status effects the Starmobile had, it stood no chance against my attacks. With just one single hit, it was down to 10% of its health. And that was it for the Team Star fighting crew. We took a photo together, and she was pretty nice. She gave me the close combat TM. As usual, Cassiopeia called me up and paid me my young mula cash money. Now, about your reward. I'll transfer some LP over to your phone. As promised. And of course, 
Penny showed up. At this point, I was starting to think that Penny is low-key somebody else. I'm just saying, what if she's Cassiopeia? Like, that, that's my theory, honestly. She just keeps showing up at the perfect time. The next stop was the city of Monte de Vera. So I made my way to the gym. And once I was inside, the girl told me to go talk to another person named MC Sledge. So I spoke to him and he was apparently a rapper and wanted me to do some double battles. So we had to light up the stage, you know, practice my performance skills. So by doing that, I battled a bunch of different trainers there. My first contestant was this kid. I guess that gets the crowd cheering. So I pretty much had to get the crowd riled up who was going to be next. After all, the person that was going to be coming up is a very famous celebrity or rapper or Pokemon trainer, rapper, gym leader thing. And for the final battle, it was none other than MC Sledge himself. He sent out a Sableye and a Drifblem. I was honestly very excited to fight him and the battle didn't last that long. No, not at all. It was you who sledged me up. Well, that definitely got the crowd cheering. And now it was finally time for the final act. I passed my gym test, and so Rhyme, the gym leader, showed up. Don't try it with me. You won't last one round. I'm like a sable lie. My eyes gonna lock you down. No, roasted! Hey, after all, it is her concert. I literally warmed up the stage just so she could show up and roast somebody. So I sent out my two deadly combos, Leafy and Beckfist. I used Night Slash on Bennett. Then I hit a Mimikyu with a Shadow Ball, which got rid of its ability. The Shadow Stick did do some damage. But don't worry, I did not stop Leafy from backing me up. Once I defeated the Houndstones, even more Houndstones started popping out of graveyards in the crowd. That was intense. And Miss Rhyme over here terrestrialized her final Pokemon into a Ghost Toxtricity. And with one Night Slash, it was gone. Good job, Leafy. And that was the last time I ever saw Rhyme. Or was it? Watch the other video. Well, we took a photo and I received Shadow Ball as my reward. And as soon as I finished, Gita was right there, just waiting for me. Oh, and Nemo showed up. Of course, of course Nemo has to show up at the perfect time and challenge me to another battle. At least this time, her Pokemon were a little bit stronger, so I didn't hesitate to terrestrialize Beckfist. So as usual, I stacked up my signature move, Torch Song, and started wiping out that team. There still wasn't one single Pokemon I couldn't one-shot. I'm just saying. And with the quick claw item that I gave Beckfist, he was able to outspeed pretty much anything. Especially her Meowskarada. Well, that got Nemo motivated. She was ready to train even harder. And I was ready to complete the gym battles. On day 61 and 62, I started off my day by finding myself an Eevee. And I was super excited because one of my goals was to capture every single evolution. So I quickly captured this dude. And as I was traveling to the normal gym, I came across a dash bun. This Pokemon looked like a baked dog made of buns. That makes any sense. I caught it with a Pokeball and it turned out to be a fairy type. Leave a like on this video if you love dogs, cats, or Pokemon. Then I traveled to the Medali gym. And as I walked inside, I met up with Jack, my biology teacher. He was asking me how my treasure hunt was going. And I said I was doing great. And guess what? He hooked me up with a lucky egg. If I gave this item to any of my Pokemon, its experience points will be doubled. So that means quicker leveling for me. Now, for the Medali Gym Test, I had to go to a restaurant and order a special secret menu item at the Treasure Eatery. Now, if I ordered correctly, I would pass the test. And the only way to figure out the secret menu item was to go around battling trainers and then getting random clues. Now, my first clue was how the regulars season their dishes. Now, I found the first trainer right outside the gym. I took her on for a battle, and after defeating her Ursaring, told me to find a clue inside of this dark location behind her. I walked up to this door that looked like prison bars, and it had a secret message saying Fire Blast, which probably meant that was my first clue. Afterwards, I battled the second student. After defeating its Dunsparce, he told me to talk to a bird. So, I walked up to a dude with a Squawkabilly, and all this parrot was saying was Squawkabilly and Medium. I don't know what Medium means. Oh, oh, medi oh Medium. Oh, yeah. Not, not the most creative with this one. In the final battle, I challenged this girl. And once I defeated her gumshoes, she gave me a hint to go over to the ice cream stand and find the odd one out. Not the best hint, honestly. Now, this is where I got stuck at. I don't know what was the odd one out here. So I decided to wing it. 
I went over to the treasure eatery and I spoke to every single person inside. And this random office worker at the table said that he likes his dishes with a hint of lemon. So I spoke to the lady up front. I ordered grilled rice balls, a medium serving, extra crispy with fire blast style, and a hint of lemons. Gotcha! Medium rice balls, extra crispy, coming right up! And holy mother of moose milks, the entire treasure eatery turned into a secret gym battle arena. I don't even know what happened to the people. There was a bunch of people dining here and they just, they just disappeared. Could you imagine what the health inspection would say about this? They'd probably be in pokey jail. Oh, and that office worker turned out to be Larry, the normal gym leader of the Medali Gym. I, Larry, will be at your service. So Larry's specialty was only using normal type Pokemon since he's a normal office worker, right? I just ate, so let's not go too hard. Well, there wasn't really much I could do here. I was level 64, while Kamala was level 35. So I did my usual strategy. I stacked up Torch Song, and then he sent in a Dunsparce. Yo, I could not believe this, but this was the second evolution form of Dunsparce, and it looked like a rattlesnake with four wings. So I proceeded to use the same exact move over and over again. This is still better than getting cornered by my boss. What does that even mean, Larry? What are you, what are you talking about? Anyways, he sent out Staraptor, his final Pokemon. Come on, Larry! Step it up a notch! We've got hungry customers waiting! Give them something to cheer for you here! Honestly, I was on Larry's side, because all of his fans showed up to the battle and started cheering him on. It's just that Larry was extremely underleveled. So he pumped himself back up, and he terrestrialized that Staraptor, turning it into a normal type. But unfortunately, that was not going to save him. So with a single hit, I turned that bird into a crispy chicken nugget, quickly defeating gym leader Larry. Once the battle was over, Larry and I ate some rice balls and took photos together. Now with my 6th gym badge, all Pokemon level 50 would obey me. And my reward was this facade TM. So, for the upcoming days, I did not hesitate. I went right away to the Alphanada gym, and there she was again! She just wouldn't leave me alone! So Nemo challenged me to yet another battle! But at this point, I was just trying to complete my gym badges so I could actually use my Lucario that was level 75. So all I was really doing was just going back and forth. And within a few seconds, I wiped out the entire team. That was kind of embarrassing. I'm, I'm sorry about that. I knew I was right to believe in you. Okay, time for the real deal. The Alfred on a gym test. So Dendra is the gym leader of this location. And she's a psychic gym leader, but she wanted me to do an emotional... Uh, wait, what is that? Emotional test? I I'm so confused right now. I had to pretty much replicate the different types of facial expressions that she was doing. It, it really wasn't that hard. I'm not really sure how this is honestly a challenge. You know, back in the old Pokemon games, you'd have to fight like 10 different trainers and it was a lot more difficult. But now we just make emoji faces and then crush the next person that we're going to battle. After passing each emotional spectrum practice test. What? And I finally passed the test. Now, finally, for a serious test. Tulip, the psychic gym leader, showed up, and she challenged me to a battle. She sent out a weird-looking Frigorif. I swear I've seen this before in Pokemon. It turns out to be the second evolution form of Girafferig. And there goes the Giraffe. I destroyed the Gardevoir, the Espathra, the Florgus, and that was it. Within a few seconds, the battle was over. But on the bright side, I took a pretty cool photo. And with the seventh gym badge, all Pokemon that were level 55 that I caught will now obey me. For a second, I thought she was going to fly away with the wings on her dress. Once I got back to the gym, I met up with Rika, which introduced me to another Elite Four member. Her name is Poppy. Like Poppy Playtime. I know it's hard to believe, but this tiny little one is indeed one of the Elite Four. It's actually not hard to believe at all, but okay. I hope I get to show you my Pokemon soon, mister. So hurry up and come to the Pokemon League. It's the pinnacle of Pokemon battling happens. Wait up, Poppy. Don't leave your pal Rika behind. And the next morning, I yeeted off a gigantic mountain. And then I found a four-star raid battle, which was relatively difficult. It was against a belly bull, which I don't believe I've caught yet. The timer was kind of cutting it close. And after defeating it, I got a bunch of XP candy, which is what I was really looking for. I came across a Tatsugiri, which was a walking goldfish that is incredibly smart and has three different forms, which consisted of the stretchy, droopy and curly form oh and it was also a water and dragon type which made it pretty interesting arvin then called me up and it was time for the false dragon titan test i surfed onto an island where i found more tatsugiri and battled them and eventually the false dragon titan showed up named don dozo and with a single flower trick i one shot don dozo it quickly fled and i chased after it on of course, I lost him, but I found another Tatsugiri, and when I spoke to it, the Don Dozo showed up, smashed the hole in the wall. The Tatsugiri went inside, took the Herba Mystica, and then Don Dozo ate him. Yup, that's right, these two Pokemon actually work together. 
It's in the Pokedex. And boom, down those old Super Saiyan. Arvin hit me with one of those catchphrase lines, and I just, with the help of Leafy, I terrestrialized him, used Flower Trick, and that was the end of that. So quick. I, he literally just, in one second, just exploded. I thought that this was pretty cool. When it actually passed away, uh, the Tatsugiri showed back up, and it was ready for, like, another battle. So I battled the Tatsugiri right afterwards. I tried to change it up a little bit. I sent in Arctobax. I just had this feeling that Arctobax could possibly win, but... Yeah, it didn't work so well. So back to Leafy. Good job, buddy. And by defeating both, Arctobax started evolving. It transformed into a Baxcalibur, which is an Ice and Dragon-type Pokemon, and also looks like Godzilla. Pretty cool. Well, it was time for that sweet, sweet, spicy Herba Mystica. We took a picture together, and then Arvin used it to craft some sandwiches. On day 68 to 69, I made my way back to the Rushba squad base. First, I met up with Clive, and we spoke about how there's only two more bosses left from Team Star. Then, I went to the front door and rang the doorbell. Once again, same exact challenge. I had to defeat 30 different Pokemon in under 10 minutes. With the help of Beckfist, Leafy, and Mozilla, we were able to take out every single Pokemon in the area in just under 1 minute and 30 seconds, which was definitely a record breaker. And right afterwards, the Starmobile showed up, and Ortega, the boss of Team Star's Fairy Crew, challenged me to a battle. So I quickly terrestrialized Beckfist, and then I started stacking up my Torch Song, even though I was fighting some water types and also some fairy types. The battle honestly didn't last long at all, and Ortega sent out a level 50 Starmobile, which kind of caught me off guard, but with a single hit, Beckfist obliterated the entire machine. And just like that, the battle was over. Now, in order to shut down the Team Star operation, I only had one more boss battle left, and then it would be over. So anyways, we took a photo together, and I received the Dazzling Gleam TM, and that's it. I was on my way. Also, Mr. Harrington showed up to help out Ortega, which was kind of nice. It turns out Mr. Harrington was a piano teacher. I don't know they had pianos in Pokemon. So, as usual, Cassiopeia called me up, gave me 10,000 LP points, and then afterwards, Penny showed up. I'm still telling you, I have a theory that Penny is somebody else. Like, she's always showing up at the perfect time, and just delivering me materials. Where's she getting materials from? Ah, yes, my favorite activity, school. No, not really, I, 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 it's not like that at all. I spent most of my day in school, I spoke to the teachers around here, I even spoke to Clavel, and my goal was to pretty much get closer to every single teacher. I also met every single teacher in each classroom, and then I was just kind of on a gigantic goose chase looking for random books and stuff. It wasn't really that interesting of a day. And guess what? I had to learn some academics. Yes, this was awful. I had to take every single class multiple times, pass my midterms and final exams, all for this one moment. That's right. I met with Rayfort, which apparently knew all about these uh, specific stakes that I found before. And what do you know? These stakes actually belong to a shrine. And if you found eight stakes for each specific shrine, it would open up and reveal a legendary inside. Afterwards, I found a ditto. I caught him as well. So now I officially have two dittos and can breed anything I want. Day 74 to 75, as I was traveling through the Asano Desert, I came across this gigantic futuristic looking Rhydon. It turns out it was Iron Treads, the quaking Earth Titan, and it was actually a gigantic Dawn fan from the future. So I terrestrialized Beckfist and used my Torch Song attack. Now it was a metal type, so it instantly broke its health and it just started rolling away. There he goes. Look at him. So Mariah and I went over to the mountain, and as soon as we arrived, he smashed his trunk into the mountain, made a hole whipped out a Herba Mystica, consumed it, and became Super Saiyan mode. Now, after all, this is the final Titan that I had to battle, so I had some extremely high expectations. But with just a single hit, I melted this Rhydon into a crispy iron ingot. But towards the end of the video, we are going to uncover some more futuristic Pokemon, so make sure you watch till the end. Well, there it was, the final Herba Mystica. This time, it was a sour flavor. So we took a photo once again, and we created two different sandwiches, which healed up Mariadin and Mabostiv to their full strength, which means that Mariadin can officially fly. And Professor Turo gave us a phone call to meet him at the Poco Path Lighthouse, where he will tell us about the final mission to Area Zero. For the 8th Gym Leader, I traveled to the Kaskarafa City, where I got glitched out from flying. Nice. And I somehow passed by Kofu, which was the Water Gym Leader, he just ran by me and dropped his wallet. So this lady gave me the wallet and I had to go chase after him. And of course, I got completely sidetracked. I came across a terrestrialized guard shop and this dude was no joke. It terrestrialized into a water type and was level 65. So I terrestrialized Beckfist and what do you know? 
I got one-shotted, even destroyed Moosezilla, but I managed to break its health and finally catch him. And if you know me, I love Garchomp. And once I arrived to the Porto Barinada, I ran into Kofu just talking to flowers for some reason and saying, Fountain Valusa! I explored the city and found this massive food market, which is originally where Kofu was looking for some exotic seaweed. And apparently, this dude was Kofu's apprentice or bodyguard, named Hugo. He's in that a float cell, and I completely obliterated his Pokemon. He was kind of embarrassed, but hey, no big deal. So finally, I returned Kofu's wallet. Fountain Valusa, my wallet! <laughs> Good job, Moose. He was talking about the texture of the seaweed, and then he gave me $50,000 to bid on some exotic seaweed. This dude was insane. Oh, and this is also my gym test. So I started off with a $15,000 bid, which I got outbid instantly, and then I raised it to $35,000 and managed to close the deal. And he let me keep the change. Can you believe this guy? What a nice dude. Probably my favorite gym leader. And just like that, I passed the gym test. So I went back to the Kaskarafa city and decided to challenge him to the final battle. Now, Kofu is a water gym leader. So he started off by sending out Veluza, which makes sense why he kept saying Veluza. He also sent out a one trio, which, yo, what even is that thing? That's gotta be sus. And with this final Pokemon, I wiped him out with a Shadow Ball. And that was it. I received my eighth gym badge, which means that every single Pokemon will now obey me. And then we took this hilarious photo right afterwards. Well, since I was already in the area, I left the Kaskarafa city and then went to the outside base of Team Star. Cassiopeia gave me a phone call and told me that this location was the final Team Star base to defeat. So I spoke to the two of the grunts in the front and I took them on for a battle. And these trainers were so underleveled. So somehow I ended up with an extremely low leveled crew base to take on. Well, once I was finished with the battle, I walked towards the gate, rang the doorbell and walked inside. All right, so my new goal was to defeat this entire place in under one minute and 20 seconds. It was very ambitious, but with my three Pokemon extremely overleveled, I finished it in one minute and 17 seconds. Finally, the Starmobile showed up, and it was completely decked out in a disco type of vibe. And Giacomo was the one in charge of the Dark Crew. His alias was DJ Vice. That's right, he was a DJ, and he was ready to party. And he sent out the lowest level Pokemon that I had seen, which I wiped out in like literally five seconds. And the worst part was the Starmobile was level 20, which made it pretty easy to defeat. But unfortunately, it was in a crazy grand finale. And that concluded the end of Team Star. Rest in peace. And that right there was the final photo with Team Star. All right, so next up, Cassiopeia gave me a phone call. And then out of nowhere, Clive showed up. So I received $20,000 from Cassiopeia, and this time Clive gave me the materials, but Penny wasn't here for some reason. And out of the blue, Cassiopeia was talking about a big boss that I had to fight from Team Star. And that makes Penny even more suspicious. I'm just saying. On days 80 to 81, I traveled back to the Mesagoza city, and I went to the UVA Academy. And there he was, Clive. He was ready to reveal his secret identity, which I'm pretty sure we all knew what it was. Right? I, I I hope you know what it was. Director Clavel! Could you believe it? So, we got into a heated battle. Before I could face the big boss of Team Star, I had to defeat Clavel. He sent out his Oranguru Pokemon while I sent out Beckfist. So right off the bat, I terrestrialized Beckfist and got him ready. I couldn't take any chances, and that Oranguru was surprisingly taking my hits. It took me two hits to actually wipe it out. I decided to make these a little bit more fun for me, so I switched out my Pokemon to Glamoro, and I started setting up my Toxic Spike strategy. And I almost died a couple times. Then I sent in Lucario, which was my level 75. I was super excited to use him, and he almost died. <laughs> pretty, pretty sad, honestly. But now that my strategy was in place, I had to take out his entire team. So I really gave the other Pokemon on my team a chance until I sent Beckfist back in one more time. I'm telling you, Beckfist is the most overpowered Pokemon I have. I'm just saying. I defeated the Among Us, and he sent in an Obama Snow, which I melted away with my fire attacks. And for his final Pokemon, he sent out a Quackavel, which was the third evolution form of Quaxley. So to counter him, I sent in Leafy, only to wrestleize his Pokemon. He tried to defeat me with Aqua Step, but it barely did any damage to me. And with my final attack, I used Flower Trick to critical hit his Pokemon and one-shot it. And that marked the defeat of Clavel. Now he told me to go to the schoolyard where Cassiopeia's true identity would be revealed. So there I was, Detective Moose. And yes, Cassiopeia was none other than Penny. <gasps> oh my mooses, I had no idea. 
That's right, she was the big boss of Team Star. She was the one that started it all, and she was ready to challenge me to a battle. This all began with a group of students that were getting bullied in school. They started Team Star to not be bullied, and then Cassiopeia, the leader of the group, got bullied. Yeah, it's a lot. Anyways, I defeated her Umbreon. Then, I battled Vaporeon using Toxtricity. Now, against her Flareon, I sent out Glamora and used my Power Gym attack to defeat it. Next up was Jolteon, which I also poisoned with my Toxic Spikes. And then I switched back to Beckfist, defeated Leafeon, and it was time for her final Pokemon, Sylveon. So she terrestrialized this Pokemon, and surprisingly, I didn't one-shot it. I was honestly so happy. But Penny definitely held her ground, and that was it for the battle. And my reward was $15,000. Now, Director Clavel was really considering expelling every single Team Star member since they were not attending school and so on. But since Team Star was disbanded and Clavel was a lot happier now, the Team Star members showed up and surprised Penny. And luckily, we talked it out so everybody was completely fine, nobody was in trouble, nobody got expelled. But that right there completed the Starfall Street questline. Let's go! On days 82 to 84, I was on a mission. I had to get every single legendary inside of this Pokemon game. So I started off by finding all eight purple stakes. And once I pulled them all out, the purple ruin was officially open. As soon as I walked up to it, a legendary snail popped out of nowhere. And his name was Wochian. It was level 60 and it was a dark and grass Pokemon. So I sent out Beckfist and quickly weakened its health using Hyper Voice. Then I started throwing an absurd amount of Ultra Balls until eventually the final one worked. It turns out this Pokemon drains life force from vegetation, causing nearby forests to instantly wither, which is probably why I was locked up inside of a shrine. And my luck just kept on getting better. I found a terrestrialized Jolteon, which I also captured. After all, I was trying to complete my evolution team. Next up was the Yellow Shrine. So I went searching for all eight different yellow stakes all around the Paldea region, which surprisingly wasn't that difficult, especially now that I was able to fly with Mariadon. Then once I pulled them all out, I heard a mysterious cry coming from the shrine. And as I put my hand on the Yellow Shrine, Jean Pao, a Snow Leopard popped out. So my strategy going into this was using Slowbro and putting the Pokemon to sleep while weakening its health. And guess what? That didn't work at all. Now, the battle still took me over 40 different Pokeballs, and I ended up being left with Beckfist to take on this Pokemon, which it was actually created by the hatred of people who wielded the sword that's currently in its mouth and died. Very dark story. And out of the blue, I found a flying Dragonite, so I captured him as well. Next up was the Blue Shrine. So I went searching for all eight different blue stakes all around the Paldea region. And once I found them, I went inside of a cave where the blue shrine was located, and there it was! I did not expect to find a legendary goldfish. Like, wh what is Pokemon doing, man? I feel like they're out of ideas. At the same time, it was kind of adorable. So I captured Chiyu, a level 60 ruinous Pokemon, which was a dark and fire type. And it was created by the Envy from the curved beads on its eyes, which turned into fire and created a Pokemon. As Pokemon kept on getting weirder, I came across a terrestrialized Glaceon, so I captured it as well. Finally, I went searching for all eight different green stakes around the Paldea region. And once I completed it, I opened the green shrine and a legendary moose came out of it. Its name was Ting Lu, a level 60 Pokemon, which was a moose with a gigantic ball on top of its head. You could probably throw a basketball in there. So I sent in Godzilla to weaken its health, and even with terrestrializing, I was still extremely weak. On the bright side, at least I was getting beat up by a moose instead of a goldfish. Then I sent in Slowbro, used Yawn, put the Pokemon to sleep, and finally took it out with a Premier Ball. This was the greatest moment in my life. I finally found the Pokemon I've been searching for. It was a dark and ground type, and it can split the earth open by using its antlers. So finally, I met up with Arvin at the Poco Path lighthouse. He's a little bit jealous that I arrived here before him, which I'm not sure how that's possible, especially because I just captured four legendary Pokemon. We walked inside, and this entire place looked abandoned, almost as if no one was here for years. And suddenly, Professor Turo appeared on the computer screen. He was asking for help. Now, I was getting some weird vibes, but Professor Turo was talking about Area Zero, and that the Violet Book is what he needed. So our mission was to go to the deepest part of Area Zero, and deliver the Violet Book to Professor Turo himself. Arvin was a little bit upset because that was actually his father, which he hadn't spoke to in years. So we continued by having a heart-to-heart -heart conversation. Arvin was just telling me about, well, his whole entire life, but I decided to accept the mission. And with all his anger, he decided to challenge me to a battle. Let me give you a taste of what we can do. He sent out a gigantic fluffy chipmunk. So I terrestrialized Beckfist and I truly pushed Arvin's skills. 
If we were going to complete this mission together, I needed Arvin to be strong and be able to hold himself up. Next up, he sent a Garganical, which was relatively tough, and I actually couldn't one-shot, but I kept the battle going. After all, my Pokemon were level 70, so most of his Pokemon didn't stand a chance, but this weird-looking Toad's Accrual almost killed Breakfast. His final Pokemon was Cloyster. I already knew that this was not going to be possible for me, but I managed to survive its water-type attacks. And with my Torch Song, I wiped out that water-type. Next, he sent in a Scovillian, which I ended up turning into some burnt peppers. Sarvin was down to his final Pokemon, and it was none other than Mabostiff which he terrestrialized into a dark type. Now, the whole point of taking out all those titans was to revive Mabostiff after he got injured in Area Zero. I'm so sorry, Mabostiff. Nothing personal. And before we can head over to Area Zero, I had to prove myself worthy by taking on the Champion League and then afterwards, Nemo, Penny, and Arvin would go down with me to Area Zero. And that right there concluded the Path of the Legends questline. Next up was the Elite Four. So I met up with Rika, where I had to take on a champion assessment test and pretty much answer a bunch of questions in order to proceed to Elite Four, which was a piece of cake. So I stepped inside the first room and it was none other than Rika herself. She sent out a Whiskash and most of Rika's Pokemon consisted of ground types. So by using Beckfist, it was a little bit challenging, but I had a pretty crazy advantage as I was level 80. So I quickly sweep through the Pokemon team and by using Earth Power and stacking up the Torch Song for the special attack increase. And since her Doug Trio and Camera were only level 57, it really stood no chance. So she finally sent out her final Pokemon. It was a Claude Sire, which she terrestrialized into a ground type. So I used my final attacks and sweeped her final Pokemon. And that concluded the first Elite Four. Next up was Poppy. She was super small and adorable, but she was ready to challenge me. And all her Pokemon consisted of Steel types. She began the battle by sending out a Copper Raja. So I sent in Beckfist and started stacking up my Torch Song. And I started melting away her team. Next up, she sent out a Bronzong, which had turned into a Steel Ingot. I was expecting the Corviknight to hold its ground, but that didn't happen. She then sent out a Magnezone. This one barely hung on with its sturdy ability. But I finished it off with Shadow Ball. Rest in peace, Magnezone. For her final Pokemon, it was a pink elf with long hair and a gigantic hammer. She terrestrialized the Tinkaton into a Steel type, which was the worst idea ever because Torch Song burnt it into crisps. And that's what you get for using Steel types against a Fire type. Wah, wah. I just, I just wanted to take revenge on Eureka. Don't judge me. I'm pretty sure that's what she would sound like if she had a voice. I'm just saying. Next up was Larry! I could not believe that the normal gym leader was also an Elite Four. I gotta say, Larry's probably one of my favorite characters. He just seems like a really chill dude, and he works an office job, according to him. So all of his Pokemon consisted of flying types, so by using Rocky Moose with his power gem attack, I was able to wipe out most of the team. Then he sent in an Altaria, so I sent out Moosezilla. The Altaria used Dragon Pulse, but with my Avalanche attack, I wiped it out. We were down to Oricorio, so I let Moosezilla have the stage and really show off his strength. Well, it came down to Flamigo. Larry terrestrialized it into a flying type, and they used a close combat attack. I sent out Rocky Moose, used my Mortal Spin attack to poison the Flamigo, and then I sent out Beckfist, where he ate the hit, and I finished the job with the Shadow Ball. Now, that's what I call sweet revenge. You're a lot stronger than I recall. No wonder La Primera likes you. All right, then. Miss Helm, it's your turn. Well, what do you know? My art teacher turned out to be the Dragon Elite Four member. They didn't believe it, bro. It was Hussell. He started off by sending out Novern, a poison and dragon type Pokemon. So with the help of Rocky Moose, I was able to set up my Toxic Spike ability. So I used Mortal Spin on Novern and ended up poisoning it. But eventually, I knocked out that Pokemon. Next up, he sent out Dragalga, which one-shot me using Hydro Pump. But luckily, I managed to lay out my Stealth Rock attack before Rocky Moose died. So I came in with Godzilla and used the Glaive Rush attack. He then sent out a Flapple, which used Dragon Rush and absolutely killed Musilla. So I used Jeff. This dude used Leech Seed on me. But with Ruination, I halved his health and then survived his Seed Bomb attack and finished him off with the Throat Chop. So then I sent in Muscario and he obliterated the Haxorus by using Ice Punch. So I sent out Musilla one more time and I terrestrialized it. Now this was the final showdown. Two terrestrialized Baxcalibers facing each other off. And the only thing determining this battle would be the speed of one Pokemon. All right, come on. What do you expect? That Musilla was going to lose? I managed to outspeed that Baxcalibur and knock him out with my Glaive Rush. Now that just looked painful. 
the mighty dragon has been felt. So after I defeated four elite members, everything I worked for as a Pokemon trainer was leading to this moment. So there I was for my final showdown with champion Gita. She sent out an Espathra, so I sent in Rocky Moose. Now I had to play my strategy. She hit me with the Lumina Crash Attack, and I managed to get my Toxic Spice on the floor. But unfortunately, Rocky Moose died. So I sent in Jeff, the legendary Moose. It was finally time for him to shine. I managed to eat up Espathra's attacks, and then I used Gochop to knock out that ostrich. She then countered me by sending out a goat. I'm not sure what that thing was going to do, but it didn't last that long. Then I sent in Beckfist against her Pokemon, King Gambit. So I quickly to wrestleized and melted that bucket of steel. Gita tried countering me by using a gigantic iceberg, which didn't really make much sense. And her next Pokemon turned out to be a Veluza. Have you ever heard of the saying, don't bring a Barracuda to a crocodile fight? Well, I had no other choice but to knock that thing out. So, I gave Leafy the final chance, and her final Pokemon was Glamora. She terrestrialized it into a ground type, and with Leafy's single attack, I used Flower Trick and Critical Hit that Pokemon out of here, and that officially concluded the Champion League battle, and I became Champion Moose! Let's go! You go beyond my imagination, it is my honor to call you Champion Moose. The rest of the Elite Four gang showed up, and they came here to congratulate me, including Larry. Yo, what nice people, honestly. Masal even started crying for some reason. I don't know what was wrong with him. So, Gita walked me to the front entrance of the UVA Academy. But my journey was not over just yet. I still had to uncover the secrets of Area Zero. And the only way to do that was with the help of Arvin. And that officially marked the completion of the Victory Road quest. On days 89 to 90, I went to the Zero Gate and met up with Arvin. Together, we walked inside of this weird bunker over here and we began the way home quest line. Now, once we were inside, Henny and Nemo showed up and they were here to help me out. I couldn't believe it, but we had the entire Moose squad working together. So, Professor Turo gave us a phone call and he opened the gate to the lower level. As we walked inside, Mirider was a little bit skeptical about going back to Area Zero, which is apparently where it escaped from. So, we hopped on its back and flew straight down into the area. Once we arrived there, Turo gave us another mission. This time, we had to uncover all four different laboratories, go inside of them, disable all four locks, and that would officially open the laboratory where Professor Turo was trapped inside. I know it's a little bit confusing, but this will all make sense very, very soon. Just keep watching. So along the way, I found so many different high-level Pokemon, and I found me an Espeon. I tried my best to catch every single Pokemon, therefore completing my Pokedex quicker, and this Dawn fan would not stop chasing me. He tried to run me over multiple times. I don't know what his problem was, honestly. Now, this entire area was surrounded by Pokemon that was guarding each laboratory. So when we visited the first laboratory, a Glamora attacked us. Together, Penny and I fought this Glamora, and she pretty much did all the work. After her. Then, we walked inside, and this entire place was completely abandoned. Professor Turo gave us a phone call again, and he was telling us that this facility was constructed 87 years ago as a station to be used for surveying Area Zero. So, they were clearly looking for something down here. I'm not exactly sure what. Could be something to do with those gigantic crystals. Anyways, I disabled the lock, and I read the books around here, which was talking about Terra Orb and what Pokemon terrestrialization came from. As we went to the second laboratory, this weird-looking robotic Pokemon attacked us. Its name was Iron Treads, and it looked like a robotic deli bird. Somebody tells me that thing is from the future, and it's probably going to kill us. This was really giving me those Terminator vibes. I don't know what it was, man, but why was this Pokemon trying to kill me? I thought Pokemon were friendly. So we walked inside of the second laboratory. Arvin whipped out his book, and we started describing what we just saw. He was saying that the Iron Treads was very similar to the description inside of his book. And Nemo was also a little bit confused, so she was asking me for my opinion. I just pretty much told her that they're just regular Pokemon. Some of the life forms that you see residing now within Area Zero are future Pokemon that lived in a distant day we have yet to see. Alright, this might get a little bit confusing, but what Professor Turtle meant is he created a flippin' time machine! And he found a way to take a Pokeball and transport it in the future and bring back a futuristic Pokemon. I'm telling you, these Pokemon professors are just mad scientists. On days 91 to 92, getting to the third research station wasn't that difficult. And once we got there, as Nimona said, we got to chill for a minute until an Iron Treads attacked us. So Arvin and I teamed up and battled this thing. And within just two hits, we knocked it out of the park. But you could clearly see a pattern here. The closer we got to the research stations, the more these futuristic Pokemons try to stop us. We walked inside of the third research station and Professor Turo continued his story. 
Maraidon, which I entrusted to Moose, was the first Pokemon that was successfully retrieved from the future by this time machine. Now, what a shocking discovery. Even Arvin himself was completely crushed, and he's the one that worked here with Professor Turo. Anyways, I did the usual. I flicked the switch, disabled the locks, and we moved on to the fourth one. Now, there was a cave next door. I walked inside of there, and I found me an Iron Jugulus. So I quickly captured it, and it turned out to be a Paradox Pokemon. So we traveled even further into Area Zero, and this cave was filled with gigantic crystals everywhere, almost as if terrestrializing originated from this location. And along the way, I found an Iron Bundle, that Terminator-looking Deli Bird. So I quickly captured it. Then we came across the fourth research station. And once we walked inside of this place, it was just filled with a bunch of crystals, almost like an incident happening here. Professor Turo started speaking again. I am so sorry, sorry, sorry. sorry. Hello, 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 hello. And he started malfunctioning, almost like he was a robot. Initiating restart. We're just going to completely ignore that. So I disabled the lock, and then Professor Turo called us once again. He told us to make our way to the Zero Laboratory. Now, the books in this laboratory was talking about creating an artificial intelligence, almost as if Professor Toro made a clone of himself. On days 93 to 94, I reached the deepest part of Area Zero. Toro explained to us that the crystals in this area power terrestrializing and all the machinery. Anyways, I flicked the switch and the door started opening up. And next thing you know, a second Maraidon in its battle form showed up. It locked its eyes with my Maraidon and just walked inside of the laboratory. Clearly something was going on here. And I was starting to think that Professor Toro was evil. And suddenly, the Iron Hand surrounded us. So Penny, Nemo, and Arvin held them off. I quickly wiped out a few Iron Hands myself and the others decided to stay back to ensure the Paradox Pokemon do not escape Area Zero. So Jeff and I walked inside of Zero Lab and there he was, Professor Toro deactivating sleep mode. That right there confirms my theory that he's a robot. I'm just saying, man. I am not the true Professor Toro. Toro was telling me that he's an AI and the real professor passed away during the destruction of the fourth research station. And the reason he wanted me to come here was to put a stop to the time machine. Well, at this point, there was no going back. So we took an elevator down to the bottom floor. In the center was the time machine. I went over there and flicked the switch, turning it off. But that did not stop AI Turo from powering down and initiating battle mode. Yes, that's right. This AI has actually gone evil and is trying to kill me just like Terminator. All right, but to be fair, AI Turo did warn me that once I shut off the machine, it would activate a protocol just to protect itself. At last, my dream is within reach and you're not getting away. He sent out Iron Moth. So I sent in Jeff. It was finally time for Jeff to shine once again. So I terrestrialized him. And the Iron Moth tried using Fiery Dance, which did barely any damage to me. So I hit it with a Rock Slide and crushed that bug. Then he sent in Iron Hands. Tried using Fake Out, but I countered with Stomping Tantrum. Those hands were all game, no action. He even sent out an Iron Thorns, which was like a robotic Tyranitar. But Jeff absorbed his hits like it was nothing and knocked out the Iron Thorns. Then he sent an Iron Jugulus, and by using its Air Slash, it almost killed Jeff. Okay, come on. You think that was going to really hurt Jeff? He powered through it and used Rock Slide, knocking out that Pokemon. So it was down to the final two. I sent in Leafy while he used Iron Bundle. And with one flower trick, I critical hit that Deli Bird away. Once the Iron Valiant came out, Leafy just did not stand a chance. He got one shot with Brick Break. And the funniest part, I wasn't even using Beckfist, my strongest Pokemon. So to finish the job, Beckfist used Torch Song, its ultimate attack, and ended up melting away that Gallade, putting an end to AI Turo's Pokemon team. Oh, wait. It wasn't over just yet. Arvin ran into the room, and there he was seeing his, I guess, his robotic father. Thank you for everything. The time machine has finally, he has finally been stopped. Security system failure. Security system failure. I'm sorry, children. This is too much for you. You must run. You are not getting in my way. AI Turo somehow came back to life and initiated its second protocol. It sent out Maraidon and turned off all Pokeballs in this room from working. So I used Maraidon's Pokeball and sent him in. It was the ultimate showdown. AI Turo's evil Maraidon versus the Moose Maraidon. And out of the blue, my Maraidon started transforming into its ultimate form. 
This was the final showdown we were all waiting for. The only reason Mariden even escaped Area Zero was because of this Mariden, the Guardian of the Paradise. But clearly, I was outmatched here. I kept using my attacks, but they were barely doing any damage. So I had no other choice but to terrestrialize my Mariden and finish the battle with Terra Blast, putting an end to the evil Mariden and AI Turo. And everybody just nonchalantly agreed to go home. That's it. <laughs> All right, let's go. <laughs> he said it. Come on, everyone. Let's get out of here. On these 95 to 96, we all just left Area Zero and just walked back home. Man, I just felt so bad for Arvid. He went through so much. But my mission was not over just yet. I went back to Area Zero and I went searching for the final Pokemon. I found the second legendary Maraidon. So I used Jeff to take him on for a battle. I kept using Ruination to weaken his health. And then, with a single Ultra Ball, I captured Maraidon. So now I officially have two different Maraidons. And the Pokedex describes it as a Serpent Paradox Pokemon. My mission was still not over. I had to find every Paradox Pokemon in this location. So while I was in the area, I found Iron Moth, which was a Volcarona, but the robotic version of it. So I weakened its health and captured it. It turned out to be a fire and poison type. Then I found my favorite paradox Pokemon, and it was an Iron Thorns. And instead, I'm gonna call it a robotic Tyranitar. I just feel like it makes more sense for him. And with the help of Drago Moose, I weakened its health and captured it with an Ultra Ball. And this Iron Thorns turned out to be a rocket electric type, which I hadn't seen before. I also found a secret entrance to another cave system. And inside there, I found a glitched out Pokemon inside of the wall. This was the rarest Paradox Pokemon, and it was an Iron Valiant. I quickly battled it, and then went for the capture. And this Gardevoir, Glade, or whatever you want to call this thing, was a Fairy and Fighting type. And that officially completed the Paradox mission. On days 97 to 99, Gita, the champion leader, gave me a job. It turns out that now I was just working for this lady. She told me to go to every single gym, check up on them, and then battle them again to make sure they're good. I don't know what this was about, but it started off by battling Larry. Once I defeated Larry, then I traveled to Kofu and met up with this dude once again. I whooped at his Pokemon team by using Mariden. Since I had pretty much completed the entire game, all I could really do was just level up my team. And there was still the UVA Academy competition, where I got to battle every single teacher, trainer, Nimona, and Gita herself. But she would not show up unless I did this job. That was pretty much the errand boy, just running around and battling more gym leaders. Anyways, within a few seconds, my electric moves wiped out Kofu's team, and I was officially finished with the battle. Now, my next stop was a psychic gym, so I had a rematch with Tula and she sent out her psychic type named Rigoriff. This time, her Pokemon were level 65, while Dragomoose was level 76. So clearly, she was absolutely outmatched. But Dragomoose barely broke a sweat against these psychic types. No amount of terrestrializing, no fairy type attacks could damage Dragomoose, and her Florgus stood no chance at all. But in a matter of seconds, the battle was over with Tula, and she said that I did splendid. So I moved on to the bug gym. There I was facing gym leader Katie once again, face to face. I still wanted her to bake me a cake. I'm just saying, man. I mean, she owns a pastry shop, so it's only fair, right? She sent out her bug Pokemon, which I completely obliterated using my rock moves. And I showed that Teddy Ursa the power of Electro Drift. Even with Katie's defeat, she still didn't give me dessert as a reward. So it was kind of upsetting, but I couldn't waste any time. Now, oh boy, was this a toasty battle. I had a rematch with Bracius, the grass gym leader, and you can already tell how this ended. By using Beckfist, I burned through all of Bracius's Pokemon. And at this point, I think the entire match lasted for like 20 seconds. And by the end of it, he was seriously considering pulling his hair out. Next up, it was time for Iona, Iona, whatever you want to call her again. She started the battle with an electric type, so I started stacking up my earth power and wiping out every single one. I mean, just look at this poor Luxray. It just looked like something came out of the ground and just ate him. Even with her terrestrialized electric Miss Magius, she still had no power to defeat Beckfist. So at the very end of it, took a four together, and I left. I flew over to Glaciata Gym, and with these harsh ice storm conditions, I was ready to face Grusha and melted away her ice Pokemon. And at this point, I wasn't really trying to hold back. I wanted these battles over as soon as possible, and I knew that Beckfist could make this happen. And as expected, the Altaria got melted away like a thin piece of ice. She even had the nerve to say that she wouldn't lose next time, but I don't, I don't think there's going to be a next time. So for my final battle, it was against Rhyme, the ghost gym leader. I sent in Leafy and Beckfist, my deadliest combination together. Leafy's really good at landing critical attacks. While Beckfist is tanky, he can take on any opponent himself. 
if I say so myself, we really ghost busted these ghost types away. Get it? Because it's Ghostbusters and ghosts. All right, man. With Rhyme's defeat, Gita gave me a phone call. Hello, am I speaking to Champion Moose? I was informed by each gym leader that you completed your task. So, that marked the completion of Gita's gym leader rematch. Now she could finally show up to the UVA Academy battle. On day 100, all the teachers, classmates, Gita, and Director Covell gathered here at the UVA Academy. Excellent! It seems everyone is here. Today's tournament was organized by your student council, truly, Nimona. And you know her. She's obsessed with battling Pokemon trainers. To start the Academy battle off, it was Arvid and I facing head-to-head. -head. Now, both of us were extremely powerful, and it was honestly a pretty solid battle. I even used the same evil Maraidon, also known as Dragon Moose, that we battled together in order to battle him, which was pretty savage since it was owned by Turo. Ah, oh, it's kind of dark, actually. Anyways, I was knocking through his Pokemon. His Bell Peppers was not doing anything. He even sent out a Cloyster, which I zapped away with my electric attacks. And finally, it was time for my Boastiff. Arvin then terrestrialized him into a dark type. And with one single attack, I still one shot that my Boastiff. I kind of felt bad for him, man. I thought this was going to be his redemption. And the winner of the first round is Moose. And my next battle was against Jack, the instructor, or the biology teacher. He sent out an Arcanine, and I sent in Drago Moose. So I used Maraidon's special move called Parabolic Charge, and that zapped away that Arcanine. Next up, Jack sent in a Mudsdale, which was a little bit more tough, and this Pokemon is really notorious for hitting like a train. My only move that I could use against him was Power Gym, and he almost knocked out Dragon Moose. I couldn't risk it for the biscuit. So I switched over to Leafy and countered him with a flower trick. Next up, Jack sent in a Slowbro, which I also knocked out with another flower trick. And for Jack's final Pokemon, it was a Giraffe Rig. So with the help of Rocky Moose, I poisoned it and then used Vino Shock to one-shot it, which I really giraffed up. <laughs> and the winner of this second round battle is Champion Moose. Next on the list was Dandra, the instructor. She sent out a Phalanx, and I came back with Drago Moose. At this point, I wanted this battle over as quick as possible, so just kept using Electro Drift against every single Pokemon. Maradon was going all gas with no breaks at all. Karos, zapped. Metacham, zapped. Hariyama, also zapped. And Maradon was not holding back. The only Pokemon that barely survived was a Hariyama. And with its earthquake attack, even while terrestrialized, it barely one-shot Drago Moose. But with my final strike, the battle was over. Now, the moment that I had been waiting for was a rematch with top champion, Gita. Remember all those gym challenges that I did? Well, it was for this specific moment, just so she could participate and rebattle me. Now, she was a lot stronger than before, but Dragon Moose was still level 80, so I had a pretty big advantage. But still, her Pokemon were completely outmatched. By terrestrializing Dragon Moose and using Electro Drift, I was breezing through her team like a lightning bolt. Even that King Gambit didn't stand a chance. I even used this electric attack on a Go-Go, and it barely survived. And don't forget, that is not very effective. And finally, it was up against the Glamora. So I sent in Leafy once again, just like last time. And I used that simple flower trick against a terrestrialized Glamora, instantly one-shotting it. I officially had won the UVA Academy tournament, and thus, the strongest trainer in the Hell Academy is Champion Moose! The crowd cheered, and everybody was yelling, Moose! 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 Champion Moose was far stronger today than when he took the Pokemon League's final test. It is my sincere hope that all Palius people will be inspired, not just by him, but by every trainer. So for my reward, I received a sporty cap, which is for the Champion League. I'm so glad I met you, and I seriously mean it. I just couldn't believe that we were nearing the end. We went through this entire story and mission, and I really felt like I was attached to the game as if I was a part of it. Moments like these with the Moose Army is what really helps us connect together. But at the end, we had a phenomenal journey. So make sure you subscribe, slap the bell, and I'll see you in the next Moose movie.